Hello, hello everyone. I am so thrilled you can join us this morning with my good friend and best-selling author, Nir Ayal. Hi, Nir. Hey, great to be back. Okay, so everyone's kind of logging in. Be sure to pop in the chat, say hi, tell us where you are in the world. I am in Austin, Texas. Nir, where are you? I'm in Singapore. Oof, that is so cool. That is so the it's coolest. Not morning over here. It's uh, late, late night. <laughs> How are you going to calm down after this webinar? Like a good hot cocoa or something? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to go right to bed, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. You might be so jazzed. You might not be able to. I don't know. <laughs> oh, good. We have some people from Switzerland, from Brampton, Ontario, from Vegas, uh, from Saudi Arabia, from India. Uh, Delia said Singapore is lovely, from Concord, California, from Belgium. I love it. So what we're going to be talking about today, I've never gotten to dive into this topic deeply. So we're going to be talking about raising indistractable kids and not just raising indistractable kids but also how do we think about our own distractions as parents so i have a two-year-old daughter her name is sienna by the way near i almost i really thought about um having her like hidden under the table and just like surprising you with her but um i didn't think she'd be able to be quiet for us so so that would be something that a lot of people are experiencing right now we should get to that actually what do we do when we're working from home and we're you know we, it's not just our phones that are distracting us now it's our kids that are distracting us now that we're trying to work from home yeah so we should definitely talk about that and by the way if you are watching with your kids hi you are welcome 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 to watch with your kids or have this on the background we will be totally uh, safe for kids um while they watch because I am in that boat now all the time where I am working in the background. My kids are popping into my webinars. Who knows, Sienna might make an appearance later. So if you wanna watch with your kids, that's fine too. I don't know how excited they'll be by us, but we'll try to be entertaining right here. <laughs> <laughs> so here, tell us about your, your daughter, uh, your parenting experience a little bit, just to give everyone some context as they log in. Sure, absolutely. So let's see. So. Um, I wrote this book, Indistractable, that was published uh, late last year. And uh, uh, it's been really interesting kind of seeing the response uh, since. You know, I wrote Indistractable mostly around this problem that a lot of folks have that I had. I mean, this, I wrote this book for me more than anyone is that, you know, I found that I was getting distracted from the things that were important to me. Uh, the, the really turning point in my life where I decided I, I had to reconsider my own relationship with distraction was when I was with my daughter one afternoon and uh, we had some time planned to just have some daddy daughter time. And we had this book of activities that daddies and daughters could play together, uh, fold the paper airplane, you know, these different quizzes. And one of the questions to bring daddies and daughters together was to ask each other, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember that question verbatim, but I can't tell you what she said, because in that moment, I decided that it was a good time to just check my phone real quick, honey, let me just do this one thing. And by the time I looked up from my screen, she was gone. She realized that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was, and I had blown it. And so that's when I started to reassess in my own life uh, my relationship with distraction and why I was doing this thing that I clearly didn't want to do. And um, one of the things that I, I realized uh, is that it wasn't just with my daughter. It was happening when I was at work, and I would you know, check email or Google something instead of doing the thing I said I was going to do. Or I would say I would exercise, but I didn't. I said I was going to eat right, and I wouldn't. And so I just became fascinated with this question of why do we do things we don't intend to do? Uh, and it turns out this is not a new problem. It's not, it's not the technology's fault. I thought it would be, and it's not. Uh, Plato was talking about this problem 2,500 years ago. He called it akrasia the tendency that we have to do things against our better interest. So I started on this personal journey uh, to become indistractable. And most of the book is about what you yourself can do. And that's actually what we talked about during the last webinar. So if that's interesting, definitely go check out that link. Um, but one of the things that, that I knew I had to address uh, was what do we do about the distractibility of other people? Because I kept getting this, this question from folks of, you know, my, my kid uh, is playing video games all day long and uh, I can't get them to sit at the dinner table with us or, you know, they're not doing their home or whatever it might be. And there's so much misinformation out there and so much research that is kind of manipulated and misinterpreted in the media because it makes for good headlines. And frankly, I just wanted to know for, for a father of an 11 year old little girl, you know, how should I raise an indistractable kid? Because I, I really believe 
that the world is bifurcating into two types of people. People mm -hmm. who allow their time and their attention to be manipulated by others and people who say, no, I will control my attention, I will control my time, I will control my life, I am indistractable. Because let's face it, if you think the world is distracting now, like just wait a few years. It's only gonna become more distracting, right? With virtual reality and augmented reality and who knows what else is coming down the pipes. The world is only gonna become more potentially distracting. So it is critical if you wanna give your kid a huge competitive advantage in life, you have to teach them the ability to control their attention. That is going to be absolutely critical in the years to come. And I really do think it's going to differentiate people who, who uh, live happier, uh, 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 more balanced, uh, higher states of well-being, uh, more successful lives are the people who will call themselves indistractable. So what, what you're talking about here is really important. So by the way, for anyone who didn't see our first webinar, um, we're going to pop the oh, Fabulous, Scott put it in the chat for us. So in October, uh, Nir and I sat down and talked about being indistractable as adults, and we dove really deep into that science. What we don't often get to do is dive even deeper into a skill and then think about how that affects other people. So I highly recommend go watch that after this webinar. Today, we're actually trying to translate the superpower, not only for us, but giving this to our children. And as Nir said, this is a competitive advantage for them. This also helps us feel more in control of our time. And right now, we are in a very uncontrolled time. Right? I don't know about you, I wake up every day and I kind of wonder, what does the world have in store for me? And so what Nir is talking about is uh, bringing back our, our, our heightening our internal locus of control. The more control we feel we have over our time, over our distractions, over what's happening in our home, the more sense of calm we have, the greater sense of well-being. I think this is a gift that we can give to our kids. So that is my goal today is to figure out how we can bring that well-being, that sense of control into our lives. So Nir, I, I want you to actually bust some myths for us. So we hear all these crazy headlines about tech Technology is destroying our distraction. What are some myths that we can bust about um, how we can raise indistractable kids? Yeah, so so the biggest myth, uh, we're going to do a lot of myth busting today. Stay, stay tuned for that. There's so many misconceptions out there. And the biggest myth is that technology is melting kids' brains. Uh, and this is not a new myth that every generation, it turns out, if you look back in uh, the historical records, Every generation does this to the young, younger generation. Uh, that uh, you know, when we were growing up, it was Super Mario Brothers and rap music and heavy metal music and the television and the radio. And if you go back far MTV. enough, uh, MTV every, from MTV, yeah, everyone yeah, melting our brains. The kids are losing their minds, right? And I mean, every successive generation does this. And and so what parents do with every generation they look for reasons why their kids act crazy. <laughs> Let's face it. Uh, I talk about in the book, uh, one of the most prevalent myths is the myth of the sugar high. Everybody knows that if a kid goes to a birthday party and they eat a bunch of sugar, they act crazy, right? Yeah. Isn't that common kind of knowledge? Yeah. It's not true. The, the sugar high is a complete and utter myth. There is no such thing as a sugar high. I know every parent thinks this. It ain't true. In fact, the only there was a wonderful study that found that the only people who experience a sugar high, or sorry, I should say the only people who experience any different behavior because of the ingestion of sugar are the parents <laughs> of kids who have eaten sugar. Here's what they did in this study. It's fascinating. They told parents that their children had had sugar even when they didn't. And they asked them to observe them, behind, observe what they were doing. And the parents acted frantic and apologized for their kids' behavior and chastised them and said, you know, oh, my kid is, you know, acting so crazy, even when they hadn't had the sugar. But the parent had thought they had had sugar, that they acted crazy. And so that's, that's a, that's, let's start there with, with the, some myth busting. There's a lot more ahead. Okay, wait, this no, wait, 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 this like blows my mind and you're hinting at something really, by the way, is anyone else's like mind blown? Like, it's so <laughs> I think that what you said here is really important is a parent's perception of their child's behavior changes when even the child's behavior is no different. Absolutely. And so 
when the parents were told your child's had a lot of sugar, their perception of their normal behavior was frantic and chaotic. And he said something really interesting and they were apologizing for their kid's behavior, which of course your child picks up on your energy and your cues and hearing you apologize for their behavior. So this kind of makes me like, a little like re, I'm reevaluating my entire parenting life in the last just three years. <laughs> and the, reason I, the reason I tell you this story is because I think that that is a wonderful uh, metaphor for what we do with all sorts of things that we think are changing our kids' behavior, whether it was, you know, Nintendo in our generation or rap music or rock and roll music or the radio. I mean, you literally look at the annals of history and with every generation, I actually just came across. Uh, Senate testimony around what the radio was doing to children's minds. And it is verbatim what people say today about social media. I mean, it is literally word for word what people say. Uh, by, the way, and if, but, by the way, your people are saying that they, you have a great course on LinkedIn learning, which is so nice, becoming indestructible. And people love your book. And then Emily's like, I'm finding this hard to believe. It's hard to believe, right? But like th th that's why I love near you're also very research focused. Um, yeah. That this was actually a research study that was done, and then we're going to try to bust more myths using research. Absolutely. So this okay. So let me tell you, this is what kills me about self help books or parenting books is oh it worked for me, so everybody do it. I take a shower at four a.m. in freezing cold water, therefore everybody should. <laughs> Not good enough for me. Okay, I want to see the studies. And it's, I mean, Google it. I mean, you can, I'm not right now. You don't get distracted. It's only, it's it's only with them. In. But yeah. later on, uh, you, you, can, you can find these studies. It's, it's a well-known myth. There is no such thing as a sugar high. Uh, what there is is a placebo effect, clearly, right? When people think that they are high on sugar, they act like they're high on sugar because the placebo effect is very real. And of course, when parents think their kids are high on sugar, they act differently, of course. And of course, the more we reinforce that language, it becomes true. And guess what? something similar is happening with technology. So back to our discussion around how do we raise indistractable kids? Let's, let's dig into the meat here, okay? This is, this is what I think every parent uh, needs to know when it comes to raising indistractable kids because, okay, let's, let's bust another really important myth. There is not one study, not one, that shows that two hours or less of extracurricular age-appropriate screen time has any deleterious effects. There has not even been one study that shows two hours or less of age appropriate, okay, very important, has to be age appropriate, screen time has any negative effects. So let's take down the, the freak out factor, because I know a lot of people's kids are spending more time with video games and apps and you know videos. Let, let's make sure we, we, we put this in perspective. No studies have shown negative effects for two hours or less. Now, what does age appropriate content mean? Any form of media. Okay, I'm not going to let my 11 year old daughter walk into the library and just read any book. There are lots of books as good as reading is. There's lots of books she's not ready for. Mm -hmm. So of course it has to be age appropriate. So the way we think about technology needs to be like we think of a swimming pool. Swimming pools are very dangerous, right? Thousands of children drown every year from swimming pools. But are we going to not let our kids swim? Of course not. We have to teach them how to swim appropriately. We don't just say, okay, have a good time, bye, and let them drown. We teach them how to swim. And so this idea that an iPad should be an iNanny is ridiculous because we don't have that bar with any medium. I wouldn't let my daughter watch TV unsupervised. I wouldn't let her read just any book without knowing what she's consuming. So it's very important that we are involved. Now, we know that with moderate amounts of screen time are not only not harmful, but they can be wonderful. It's all about what we are doing with that screen time. Are you creating something? You know, my, my daughter loves watching YouTube videos, but what kind of YouTube videos? If she's watching YouTube videos where all she's doing is consuming, that might be uh, not the best use of time. But if she's watching content that teaches her, you know, she's really into origami. So if she's learning, if she's creating, it's a wonderful tool, right? So we have to we have to figure out you know the benefits as well, uh, 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 so we can put them in proportion. Now, so we know the moderate use of screen time, no problem. What about the kids who are overdoing it? What if, what if your your child is using more than the two hours per day? And you know today many of our our children are at home and they have this inclination to use more than the two hours a day. So what what do we do then? Okay, we need to ask ourselves a deeper question. 
not to be satisfied with these simple answers like the sugar high myth, right? To just reach for the first thing that sounds convenient and absolves us parents of, of responsibility. We need to dig a little deeper and ask ourselves, why exactly do children overuse uh, any form of media? And the answer is, is quite surprising. And to understand why kids overuse, and, and it is true that we do see deleterious effects with excessive use. When you got, get into the territory of five, six hours a day, we do see declines in self-reported well-being. We see uh, increased rates of symptoms of depression. There are some core, There is correlation with some negative effects. Now let's go into why that happens. Why does a child overuse a technology? And we're not talking about the very young, right? You know, two and under probably doesn't need any more screen time than maybe Skyping with, with uh, grandma and grandpa. But you know, we're talking about you know, uh, older kids here. So in order to understand why kids overuse technology, we have to understand what's called the needs displacement hypothesis. The needs Whoa. displacement hypothesis. Whoa, says, that's I'm gonna write yeah. hold on, needs displacement hypothesis. We're getting fancy yeah. now. <laughs> there's, there's a lot more about this. If you want to actually look at the citations, it's all in the appendix of my book. There's over, over 30 pages of citations from peer-reviewed journals in the book. I mean, but yeah. the needs displacement hypothesis says that when we don't get our needs met offline, we look to satisfy those needs online. Now, what are these human needs? These human needs are what I call psychological vitamins. And these psychological vitamins come from the work of Desi and Ryan on what's called self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is the most widely accepted theory on human motivation and flourishing and well-being. It's, it's uh, over 40-year-old theory. Every psychologist on the face of the earth knows self-determination theory. Now, self-determination theory says that there are three things that every human being need. I call them psychological nutrients because we have physiological nutrients, right? We call them macronutrients. We have fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Everybody's body needs these three macronutrients. Mm -hmm. Now, what does our mind need? Well, we also have three fundamental things that we need for psychological well-being, and those three things are competency, autonomy, and relatedness. Okay, let's dive into those three things, competency, autonomy, and relatedness. And once we understand that, we can see where our kids are deficient. Okay, and I propose that children, specifically in America, I know we have an international crowd, but I think specifically in America, we have an acute problem when it comes to our children are deficient in these psychological nutrients. And they are looking for nourishment that they're not getting offline, they're looking for it online. So let's understand these. Number one, competency, okay? One of the things that we see occurring around the same time that kids started using more technology circa 2007 2008 with the rise of the iphone and then later social media something that also occurred around that time was the increased emphasis on standardized testing no child left behind common core there are areas in the united states of america where children are subjected to standardized tests starting in kindergarten three or four times a year and so what we have now is teachers teaching towards the test, many of them, not all of them, many of them, and we are creating a subset of children who are told multiple times during the year, you are not competent. Mm. And that feeling of not feeling competency is horrible. We all need it. It is absolutely critical for our psychological well-being. And when we don't feel competent offline, we look for it online. Well, when I play Roblox, when I play Minecraft, I feel competent. Look, I, I can build this universe. That feels good. And of course, the tech companies are more than happy to give kids that sensation. Now let's talk about autonomy. Autonomy is the need to feel in control, the need to, uh, to make our own decisions. Now we know that this is the most worldwide, this is the most scheduled and regulated generation in history, okay? Today, the work of Peter Gray found a few years ago that the average American child today has more rules and restrictions placed on them, 10 times more than the average adult, twice as many rules as an incarcerated felon. There are only two places in society where we can tell people where to go, what to think, what to wear, who to be friends with, and that's school and prison. And so is it any surprise that our kids come home from school when they used to go to school and they just want freedom, they want to escape, they want to make their own decisions. And in our generation, before, before what's going on today, you know, we came home and our parents said, go outside, right? Go hang out, just go do something, but get out of the house. 
Well, today, two things have happened. One, the media has perpetuated another myth, which is that we have to be very scared about all the dangers that our kids might get into, right? We've all heard stranger danger, and we're all terrified of child abductions. But if you actually look at the statistics, this is the safest time in American history to be a child today, by far. And yet so many parents are terrified. You know, there, there was a case uh, a few years ago where a couple in, uh, in uh, a suburb of Washington, D.C. was arrested for letting their kids go one mile from their home to go visit a playground one mile away. They were charged with negligence for letting their kids go to the playground. This was normal behavior a generation ago, which now has somehow become uh, uh, not normal. The and, second and by the way, the, the autonomy issue right now, so I think that kids, at first they were having a lot of rules imposed on them from school, from after school activities and dentist appointments and music appointments. Now it's a different kind of lack of autonomy, but it's still a lack of autonomy. It's so that's, right. That's the second thing that yes, 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 please, please. Yeah. please the second thing, the first thing was that for the parents who don't have the, 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 the economic means to do this, they keep their kids, they tend to keep their kids at home under lock and key. But if you have the money, what's happened is this boom in after school programming, right? So it used to be, you know, when I grew up, I just came home and I could hang out and then we'll be with my friends and go outside. Well, today, if you look at upper middle class families, what do, the, what do kids do after school? They've got the test prep, they've got the Mandarin lessons, they've got the swimming lessons, the ballet, the Taekwondo, the tutoring, and they have no time for play. And it turns out that if you want to give your, your kid the greatest gift for their psychological well-being, let them play. And specifically, free play. Free play has been found to be the most important thing you can do for your child from a psychological standpoint. Free play means that children can just interact with each other, with their peers, without the watchful eye of parents, teachers, and coaches, okay? They need time to play. Because remember, play is where we learn our place in the world. It's one thing if a parent or a teacher tells you what to do, right? You can tune that out. But if a peer tells you, hey, you know what? If you act like a jerk, I don't want to play with you. That's where we learn that we're not the center of the universe. We need that time to interact with our peers, which leads us to the third psychological nutrient, relatedness. We know that today that since, since, the, since these records were kept, children have less time for free play than any time, and the studies started in the 1950s, that the amount of time that children have to interact with each other is at an all-time low. The, 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 the playgrounds and neighborhoods of, of the, this country were singing with the sound of kids playing, and today you don't hear it anymore. They don't do it anymore uh, for the reasons we just discussed. So what do kids do when they don't have the opportunity to interact with their peers? Where do they get that it's scratched of needing relatedness? Well. They Check go out. on Instagram, they go on Snapchat, they go anywhere, you know, TikTok, anywhere to interact with their peers. It's no different from what we used to do hanging out on the phone, right? We would talk, you know, for, for hours for with hours. our friends on the phone. It's the same thing. So again, if they're not getting it offline, they're looking for it online. And so if we are to understand why kids overuse, we have to understand that the technology is the symptom. The overuse is the symptom, not the cause. The cause are these psychological nutrients that are missing from children's lives. Mm -hmm. And so what, why this is important, I think, is that when we think about what's happening right now, especially, is all of those nutrients and the levels of the, 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 those nutrients are changing, right? So we have even less autonomy, at least in our, in our neighborhood. We can't leave our house, or if we leave our house, it's under very important or special circumstances. We also have less relatedness. We're getting even less of that nutrient because our kids can't necessarily go across the street and play with a neighbor. They can't have a play date. They can't go to, you know, like Sienna used to go to her little local gym where she would chat with other kids, or we would see our friends with kids and all hang out in the front yard. All that is gone. And so what's happening right now, especially, is we're trying to fill in the blanks or fill in the gaps of these um, nutrients. And yeah. one of the first ways we turn to that is technology. The question is, Nir, and this is a big one I have for you, and I'm hoping you can give me some guidance, is how do we still fill those, give, give people those nutrients without having technology be the only answer? Yeah, so I would, I would start with the fact that actually technology can be some of the answer. Mm -hmm. That uh, 
uh, just because it's a, it's a screen doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It's about how much you're using it, what you're doing with it, who you are, and what you would be doing instead of using it. So right. the first thing is to not guilt ourselves into thinking that, oh, my kid's in front of a screen, that's bad, right? There's a lot of good that comes from screen time. In fact, if you look at the demographic trends, all the bad stuff, and this is pre-corona, of course, but all the bad stuff that kids used to do mm -hmm. is at an all-time low. We think about how you know kids are, are now, you know the increased suicide rates, depression rates, and some of that is true. There's more intricacies to the data, but if you actually think of everything else, drug use, teen pregnancy, truancy, smoking, all of that stuff is at an all-time low. This was the generation of the super predator. They built prisons all over the country because we thought there was going to be an explosion of crime. And it never happened. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because if you wanted to build a machine to keep kids off the streets, off the roads, and safe inside, guess what? Maybe this is not such a bad idea. So we have to realize that you know, our lives don't exist in a vacuum. People will spend their time doing one thing or another, and if it's not getting into trouble like we used to get into trouble when we were kids, let's face it, you know, it may be a better solution during those difficult and dangerous teen years might be to, to play video games or interact with their friends. So it's really about not necessarily how much time, but the quality of that time. So for example, quality, you know, yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and I would argue that, you know, I think a lot of people are, are thinking that there's this lost generation that, you know, kids are at home now, so they're homeschooling and they're missing something from traditional school. I, I, I think we need to give ourselves a break, you know, especially with, you know, and, and I'm a little biased here. I have to admit, I've been homeschooling uh, our daughter. My wife and I have been homeschooling our daughter for the past six years now. And the first question we always get, and now I realize, you know, many people now are, are homeschooling, not by choice, but by necessity. And the question we always got uh, with you know homeschooling our daughter was, what about socialization? You know, how is she going to socialize? And my answer was, you know, I don't remember middle school being such a wonderful place to socialize. <laughs> I remember a lot of bad things. You know, when you stick a bunch of kids into a room together. Uh, like caged animals, some of them behave like animals, whether it's clicks and... Uh, My middle oh, school. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's some real upside. In fact, some of the research shows that it's much better for kids to spend more time around their parents as models of behavior than it is to model the behavior of, of their peers. So okay. give yourself a break. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Yeah, um, okay. and, and it's about how we can use this stuff. Okay, so you know, in the last episode, we talked about episode, now we're a series, but in the last uh, webinar, we talked about internal triggers and how that's the first place to start, that all distraction turns out, the, the leading source of distraction are these internal triggers, these uncomfortable emotional states, fear, loneliness, boredom, fatigue, uncertainty, that's what prompts us to get distracted. And so the same goes for our kids. When they are not getting those psychological nutrients, they are looking for it elsewhere. So the good news is we can actually leverage technology to help them feel competency, autonomy, and relatedness in smart ways. So for example, um, you know, my daughter, I have to say, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, she, she's been homeschooled for a long time, but her friends weren't. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, she has more time playing with her friends online and just using Zoom. I mean, that's almost all she uses is Zoom. She has more time with her friends than she did before this crisis. And you know, what are they doing? They're chit-chatting, they're playing cards, right? They found games that they could both play on either sides of, of Zoom, uh, that, so they play cards. Uh, they just have a great time uh, interacting with each other. And, and so that actually, so, so that's the first step, is to find how we can fulfill these psychological needs in healthy ways. You look like you had a question there, and don't want yes. to interrupt you. Yes, I have a question, which is, I think actually now that you're saying this, it's making me feel hopeful because it feels like what your daughter is doing is the equivalent of free play online. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And of course, within reason. Within so this actually is a great is a great segue to step two. So step two uh, is is about making time for traction. Okay. So I remember when my daughter was was five years old. Oh wait, let me back up. So what is traction? For those of you who didn't tune in last time, so traction is the opposite of distraction. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. That traction is defined as any action that pulls us towards what we want to do, things that we do with intent. 
The opposite of traction is distraction, any action that pulls us away from what we plan to do, okay? So traction, distraction. So the second step is to make time for traction. So if your kid wants to play video games, right, two hours or less is fine as long as they do it on a schedule. They shouldn't turn to it when homework is boring, when they don't want to help you, and that's when it's a bad thing. When they're escaping the internal trigger by distraction, that's when they're doing what they didn't plan to do versus what they did plan to do. And so one of the things that we've got to do uh, for ourselves as well as for our kids is replace our schedules. You know, today, because of the coronavirus, because of so many of us working from home, the structure that we used to have in our life has disappeared, right? So, uh, you know, it's actually funny. I was looking on, on uh, the, the, I saw this story the other day about how Google is seeing uh, this huge spike in people searching for the term, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> People can't keep track of what day it is because they're just losing track of time because there aren't the constraints, the, 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 the you know, the, uh, I got to get up in the morning, make my kids breakfast, take them to school, get to the office, have lunch, have the meetings. We don't have those, those mile markers in our day to keep us on track. And so the days kind of all mesh together. And so what we have to do is to replace those schedules. Uh, and it turns out that when schedules are people resist this practice because we think of of constraints and schedules being imposed on us and that elicits what's called psychological reactance that sense of rebelliousness when someone tells you what to do oh we hate that right we, we don't you know don't micromanage me or don't boss me around but it turns out that if we do it to ourselves if we say wait a minute we are in charge of our time and we're going to make our own schedule that's actually where we flourish, that we flourish under constraints when they are self-imposed. Okay. And so how do we integrate this with our kids? It starts by making a schedule, okay? Very important to sit down with your child and involve them. Don't impose your schedule on them, right? Because then you're, you're degrading their sense of autonomy that we talked about earlier, how important it is to have that sense of autonomy. But sitting down with your children based on their age and coming up with a schedule. So let me tell you what I did with my daughter when she was just five years old. When she was five years old, I remember the, the iPad was, was relatively new. I think it had just come out around, around then. And some of her, some of her uh, most frequently repeated words were iPad time, iPad time, iPad time from a very young age. That's what she would say, iPad time. And we knew we had to do something about it because it was getting out of control. And so we sat down with her and we, we wanted to make sure we didn't you know, scare her. We didn't like, I hear some parents uh, sometimes they say, oh, you know, it's gonna rot your brain and technology is bad for you. You're gonna, you know, it's gonna do all this bad stuff. We didn't wanna frighten her because look, you know, the jobs of the future depend upon tech literacy. We want her to be comfortable with technology. We don't want her to be a technophobe. But what we did say is look, using technology, you know, uh, uh, playing on the iPad or watching a video or doing whatever you're doing with a screen, it comes with a cost and that cost is an opportunity cost. It's the opportunity to play with mommy and daddy, to talk to grandma and grandpa, to uh, be with a friend, to read a book, to engage in other things. So let me ask you, we asked her, we said, how much time would you like to spend with the iPad? Okay, we asked her this. We gave her the agency at just five years old. We gave her the agency and control. I thought, I was terrified she'd say, well, all day. <laughs> but that's not what she said. Here's what she said. She said, how about two episodes? Now, two episodes, uh, she, was th she was saying Netflix episodes. Two episodes is about 45 minutes. I got no problem with 45 minutes, that's fine. But here's what I said. She thought she was winning me over here. She thought she was getting a deal. I said, okay, here, fine. You get 45 minutes, that's how much time you want, right? So you have time for all the other things you wanna do in your day. But here's the thing. How will you enforce your own rule? Okay, because if I see that you're abusing your rule, we're gonna have to have another conversation. How are you going to keep that promise to yourself? So she thought for a minute, and here's what she came up with. She, at the time, we lived in this apartment that had a microwave below the countertop. And so she could walk up to it. She said, Daddy, how about this? I can use the timer on the microwave, and when the timer beeps after 45 minutes, then I'll know it's enough. I said, great. Okay, and that's what she started doing at five years old. Now, actually, she doesn't have to use the microwave anymore. Now she says, Alexa, set a timer for 45 minutes. <laughs> and she knows how much time she has. Or now the tools come right built into the phone, right? And her iPad has screen time built right into it. So we can use these techniques. Now, why is this so important? Because remember, we are not raising children as parents 
You are not raising a child. You are raising a future adult, okay? We're not raising children, we're raising future adults. So if you impose those hard rules, not only are, are you going to in, inflict psychological reactants, you're gonna make the kid want to rebel, you're gonna create little cheaters, right? Because what happens when they go to a friend's house or they leave for college? You know what they're gonna do. They're gonna go crazy. They're gonna say, yay, I'm free. And they're gonna do all the stuff you told them not to do. Mm -hmm. So what we wanna do is to teach them to regulate themselves by making a schedule, sticking to it, and using these practices to become indistractable. And I will say this has worked extremely well, even with, so Sienna is not even two, she's 21 months. And um, we have our own version of this, even at 21 months, and it sounds something like this. So our version of iPad time is frozen time. She loves frozen, loves it. We've probably watched it 400 times by now. <laughs> I had a webinar a couple weeks ago where it was like 200 times. I think we're at 400 now. Um, and so she's always, so a couple months ago, she was always asking for frozen time. And just like you, my husband and I were like, this isn't great because there's so many things to do. We're playing in the backyard. We wanna make pancakes together. We can play with her baby dolls. We can read a book, we can do puzzles. Yet she's saying frozen time. And so what Scott and I thought is, okay, when does she really, really savor it? Like, when does she really like it? And it yeah. seemed that after work, the way that we all unplug as a family is we always go on a walk. It's the only way, by the way, I can get away from my devices. It's like, I literally have to leave the house. So we always go on a walk. And we found that after a walk, we're kind of hot, we're kind of sweaty. Mm -hmm. And that's like when she can kind of settle in for about half of a Frozen movie. And it's usually about half on a longer day, maybe it's the whole movie, depending on how we feel. Mm -hmm. That is the time where as a family, we tend to enjoy just sort of sitting and savoring it. She now knows that it's not Frozen time in the morning. It's not frozen time at lunch. She knows that at the end of our walk, when we turn onto our street, she goes, frozen time, frozen <laughs> time, because she knows that at the very end of our walk, she's gonna get to have frozen time. And so yeah. even in this way, we found that that has worked. And now she very rarely asks for frozen time during the other parts of the day, because I think that she already knows that she gets it at the end of our walk. At yes, the end of our and day. you're hitting on an insight that works with toddlers and teenagers, Woo! which is, yes, it really does. And here's how it works. When we don't allow kids to schedule that time for the activities that they like, including the on-screen activities, they, it leads to what's called rumination, right? If a kid is thinking, when can I play Fortnite? When can I play Fortnite? When can I play Fortnite? They're thinking about it all day, as opposed to making a schedule and saying, you know what? After dinner, after the dishes are cleaned, from 8.30 to 9.30, that's your Fortnite time. And don't become the distraction yourself, okay? A lot of parents, they constantly interrupt their kids when the kid just wants to play the video game, let them play. If it's I'm what they plan to do with their time. You're watching, but you, my mom did that totally all the time. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't be the interruption either, right? What are you doing if you're saying it's okay to just get distracted from everything? Of course, they're gonna distract you back. So so it's, it's fine to do that activity. And in fact, you're going to help them uh, segment it because they know, okay, I don't have to ruminate on it, it's coming. Right? I know when that time is to, to hang out with my friends uh, over a Zoom call or uh, Instagram or Fortnite or whatever it might be, that time is in my day. I'm gonna keep that scheduled. By the way, you know everything we're talking about right now, we're talking about how to raise indistractable kids, but I'd be remiss not to talk about how if you wanna raise indistractable kids, the best thing you can do is to become indistractable yourself because you know children come built in with what we call a hypocrisy detection device okay <laughs> they come with these little antenna that are constantly scanning for where mommy and daddy are being hypocrites <laughs> and you can't tell your kid oh stop stop playing fortnite while you're checking email or facebook it doesn't work that way we've got to set the example ourselves and i've also learned that i think that at least Sienna, she realizes when I'm even talking about my own struggles with distraction or even my husband's struggles with distraction, like sometimes I have trouble closing my computer and putting down my phone. I think that verbalizing that struggle is a sure. really beautiful way to be honest and transparent and vulnerable with our kids. We yes. struggle with it just as much as them and we shouldn't pretend that we have this superpower that we're all indistractable. And so I've been getting in the habit of, as she's getting more and more verbal of being like, oh, I just wanna check my Instagram a little bit more. Oh, you know what? I shouldn't, I really wanna make sure that I have family time. Yeah. Just 
verbalizing that and she's listening. Like I can see, see that she's listening. And so I would also highly recommend being transparent with your own struggles as you learn to be indistractable. If you're gonna go pick up indistractable, which if you don't have it, you must, must have it in your library. Go through the chapters and talk to your kids about it. Decide Absolutely. that as a family, you're gonna embark on a, on a learning challenge for the entire month that you're all gonna work on being indistractable and setting up some of these and understanding our own internal triggers, especially if you have tweens and teens or even like college students, 20 somethings, 30 somethings who are living at home. It might be a great opportunity to say, you know, as a family, we're gonna all figure out our internal triggers and see if we have similarities in the house. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a book club discussion guide. The very last page of the book has these discussion guide questions. I make it really easy for you to have these discussions. And, um, you, know, we, you know, a lot of people, a lot of parents resist being vulnerable. They think, oh, if we admit mistakes, we are somehow breaking this image of our kids seeing us as perfect. And it, it, it's actually research shows it's exactly the opposite, mm -hmm. that people trust you more when you reveal your vulnerabilities. Even when you screw up, if you can talk about it, children need to hear the stories of how you have faced adversity, messed up and gotten better. They need to see that example. If they think you're perfect, they don't want to admit their own mistakes. Whereas if you can show them, look, you know what? I, I plan to do this and now I got distracted. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out this model, the four steps of becoming indistractable. You know, let's talk about this together. How can we change elements of our life so that we can both, so we can help each other become indistractable? Mm -hmm. um, are there any other myths near that you wish, like now that we are actually talking with hundreds of parents, how, what are the other myths that you wish we could just bust right now? The research says, nope, those aren't true or yep, that's true. Oh man, there are so many. So let, you know what, maybe for the sake of time too, I'll, I'll walk through kind of how we can use these four parts. So we talked a little bit about mastering the internal triggers. There's a lot more there that we didn't get to that's in the book, but just for the sake of building the model in your brain, you got mm -hmm. distraction, you got traction. Then you've got external triggers and internal triggers, okay? So internal triggers are those uncomfortable emotional states that we need to learn how to cope with in a healthier manner. The next step is about making time for traction. It's about having a schedule and synchronizing it. This, I, I think we might've talked about in the last uh, uh, episode around how it revolutionized my marriage, how having that schedule sync with my wife, you know, one of the myths, actually, let me, let me bust this myth yeah. for the dads out there. This is not gonna bust the myth for women at all, but let me go ahead and do this for men. But it turns out a myth that many men believe is that they have a 50-50 share of the housework. <laughs> like no woman thinks that this is the case. <laughs> and it's not I'm, not, I'm not being sexist here. The studies show that men think that they're doing 50-50 and they're not. <laughs> right? It's not just me making this up. Uh, and so one of the things that helped us in my, in, uh, my marriage with my wife uh, help me live out my values. And one of my values is to be in an equitable marriage is to have this schedule that we synchronize. So every Sunday night we sit down together and we look at our schedules and now there's no more guesswork because we used to fight about household responsibilities all the time. My wife would say, you know, don't you see our daughter needs to be fed or the trash needs to be taken out or the laundry needs to get done. Why don't you just do it? And to me, I was like, honey, if you want me to do something, why don't you just ask me, right? What's the big deal? And I didn't realize at the time that I was asking her to do yet another job, which is to be my babysitter, right? Mm -hmm. To be my drill sergeant. And that sucks. That's not a fun job. We never have that argument anymore because we follow this practice of doing what's called a schedule sync. So that's another myth we can bust. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the third step to becoming indistractable, which is about hacking back the external triggers. So we talked about internal triggers. The external triggers, these are the usual suspects, the pings, the dings, the rings, the notifications, all the stuff outside of us that can lead us towards distraction. Now, what do we do about these various distractions in our life? I, I can talk about what we do as parents now that we're working from home with kids, but the topic of, of this conversation is about how do we raise indistractable kids? Another myth, or I think, I, I think a, a deeper truth that we don't recognize is that we, we have certainly seen over the past few years, it is true, we have seen an increase of, of, of self-reported depressive symptoms to, uh, uh, among teenagers specifically. But the deeper truth is that it's not the technology, it's the byproduct of the technology. And, and I think what the research is showing us is that the cost of these technologies is that for many people, especially kids, it's taking away their time for what we have seen study after study reveal is absolutely critical for our mental well-being, which is sleep, 
right? I don't need to preach to any of you about the importance of sleep, but if we all agree that sleep is critical, that means that anything that beeps or boops that may wake you up in the middle of the night needs to be outside of the bedroom, okay? So for children, I cannot figure out why a child needs a television or a computer or a mobile phone or an iPad or even a radio. Why should that be in their room where it might potentially wake them up in the night? They need their rest. So having a bedtime, also demonstrating what it means to have a bedtime. I mean, parents, you know, why do we tell our kids to have a bedtime, but we don't keep a bedtime? I think it's very important. We need our sleep too. So and, and, and so and having this as a rule for our children that if we are going to use technology, it's wonderful, it's great but we need to do it in the communal area. I don't recommend having these uh, these potentially distracting external triggers in kids' rooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really interesting because when I think about bedtime and I also think about my own distractions, you also have to think about what you seek before bed. And this is something that I've really been faced in the last few weeks of not having my normal routines, right? Of, okay, it's nine o'clock or it's 8.45 and the house is wound down. What are you craving? And this is both internal triggers and external triggers. I find that at that time, I get a little lost, especially right mm -hmm. now. I'm like, do I want to watch a show? Do I want to video call someone? Do I want to journal? And so what happened is I wait for an external trigger to tell me what to do. Yes. I wait and see, does someone beep bop boop me? Does, does my phone buzz? Um, is there a new number one trending on Netflix? Yeah. Which, I think that when we're talking about gaining control of different aspects of our life is not letting external triggers make choices for you. That's right. That's exactly that's right. Everything from work to your kids to your personal time is thinking about what are you seeking? When are you lost? And when are you letting external triggers answer something that actually should be an internal answer? That's exactly right. So, so my Marie Kondo like question, right? She's got, does it bring you joy? My Marie Kondo question is, am I serving the technology or is the technology serving me? Oh my gosh. I love it. I'm putting it in chat. <laughs> so if it's serving you, it's wonderful, right? If you get a notification on your phone that says, Hey, it's time for the exercise you planned. It's time to have that, that FaceTime call. It's time to read the book. It's time to whatever. Wonderful. The technology is serving you. The external trigger is prompting you towards traction, not distraction. But if you get a notification while you're with your child and you plan that time to be fully present with someone you love, well, now it's a distraction. So, you know, this is where we're turning our values into time. There's nothing wrong with watching Netflix. There's nothing wrong with scrolling Instagram. These tools are wonderful. But again, we don't want to do them as psychological escape when we don't know how to deal with that discomfort other than looking for some kind of escape, whether it's, you know, too much booze, too much news, too much Facebook, too much football, lots of mental escapes that people look for. There's nothing wrong with those escapes as long as we do them on our schedule, not some tech company's schedule. That's the difference. It's about planning these things with intent because also you know a big difference between people who are indistractable and people who are distractible is that distractible people even when they have leisure time right you sit down on your couch and you're watching a netflix film distractible people are thinking mm, should i be checking email right now or my work time or i have that thing on my to-do list i still haven't done whereas indistractable people they can enjoy it with all their heart right they're there they're fully present because that is exactly what they're planning to do Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the perfect point I think where we can summarize and wrap up here. So these are some like amazingly practical skills. I also feel like I hope everyone watching kind of feels a little bit of relief and letting yourself off the hook that technology is not bad. Distractions themselves are not bad. We're talking well, about wait, I have to, I have to stop. Distractions are bad. Diversions are not bad. Excuse so me. Yes, yes, yes. So distraction by definition is doing something you didn't intend to do. But diverting diversion is defined as just a, a refocusing of attention. That's great. It's wonderful to refocus on a movie, a good book, a conversation. That's fantastic. But distraction is always bad. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for that because <laughs> We're talking about quality and we're talking about bringing control or those routines purposely back into our life. So a couple of very practical things you can do, hopefully even to tackling one of these things today, or at least talking to your partner about it, talking to your kids about it. One is syncing up your schedules and also allowing your kids as much as possible, depending on their age, to have some autonomy with their schedule. Second, and I had never thought about it this way, allowing your child to try to fulfill one of those three vitamins, competence, autonomy, and 
relatedness. Relatedness. Either with you, with friends, with technology, thinking about filling those more purposefully. Next, being vulnerable. If you're struggling with distraction, if you're struggling with uh, setting up your own routines, share it, talk about it. Fourth, consider doing as a family a challenge where you all learn how to be indistractable, where you learn about taking control of your routines and savoring your diversions and being more purposeful with them. If you do any of these, I think it turns our family time into learning time, into being more proactive. Near, you, by the way, anyone who's watching this, you should definitely get um, Indistractable as well as Near's first book, Hooked, which is awesome. Um, I've talked about them at length before, but also if you are not on Near's newsletter, you have to get on his newsletter. So we're going to actually put that in chat for you here as well. And you had a, 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 um, a download available for people as well, right? Right, right. So there's an 80 page workbook that's completely complimentary, whether you get indistractable or not, that's available at near and far. My website is spelled like my first name. So N I R and far.com near and far.com. We just put that in the chat. And um, by the way, like your articles are always so insightful. Everything, oh, everything that you've shared here also very science based. Uh, what I'm always impressed by is how insightful you are, how science-based you are, and also how practical. That we're not just talking about theories, that hopefully these are things that we can actually use right away. Do you have any final thoughts for us, Nir? Yeah, let me give you actually, so we, we made it through the three steps. I just want to finish up the fourth step because oh, I yes. built this model. Like if you gave me the fourth step. Okay. <laughs> and this one's actually super practical as well. Right, so we talked about managing internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back external triggers. The last step is called preventing distraction with pacts. And this one is a little bit ironic. So there's all kinds of different pacts. They're called pre-commitment devices. They've been around for literally centuries, this idea of making a promise in advance so that you don't get distracted. This one is particularly great for kids. It's called an effort pact. An effort pact is when we put a bit of friction in between us and something we don't wanna do. And ironically, the way we do this, one way to do it is with technology, believe it or not. So I'm pulling up this app. I want to show everyone because my daughter loves it. This is an app called Forest, okay? And this is an example of, of what's called a, an effort pact. Here's how it works. When your child, and, and by the way, this whole technique, the fourth technique has to come last. Don't jump to this technique. You have to do the other three first. Master internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers. As the last resort, the fourth step, the, the firewall to prevent you from getting distracted is to prevent distraction with a pact. A pact is we make a promise in advance to do what we say we're going to do so that we don't get distracted. Here's what it would look like. So on that schedule, let's say your child or you has that time when you want to do a specific task, right? The, your child needs to do their homework, you need to do something for your work, whatever it might be. So this is an app, it's totally free. I don't have any affiliation, I just use it almost every day. So you have this you know, this little cute tree. Can you see the cute little virtual tree? I see it, yes. You type in how much time you want to do your work for, whatever it might be, right? So let's say I do 45 minutes. When I push plant, that cute little virtual tree is planted. Now, if I pick up that phone and I do anything with it, the cute <laughs> little virtual tree dies. I, no, I don't, I don't want to kill the tree. I don't want to kill the cute tree, right? And so this is this is something that a, a very young child can use, and I use. I literally use it every day when I do my writing because during writing, you know, when I write, it's hard. I've written two bestsellers and countless articles. It's, it never gets easy. It's always tricky, and I always want to just Google something or just check some email. That's the last line of defense to make sure that after I've done the other three steps, if I feel that need to, for distraction, I, you know, and in, in habitually pick up my phone. Oh, wait a minute. Nope. I'm doing a focused work session. That's not what I want to do right now. I don't want to kill a tree and I put it down. So we can actually ironically use technology to block distracting technology. Mm. And by the way, like, as simple as timers, like the microwave timer. I love your daughter's idea for that. Timers, all the apps that allow us to measure our time. I also am a firm believer that what's m measured actually help us be more helps us be more purposeful. It's the same with diets. They always tell you to track calories because then you're more aware of them. The more that you can even just do, and this is, I, I don't know how if you recommend this near, but even for the next week, just tracking your time, just to see where it's going. 
right? Instead of just trying to set up rules, where is your time really going? How much time are you spending on each of the different social apps? How much time are you really spending watching television? How much are you really spending in your inbox? Even just tracking things to see where your time is going. I find during this particular time where the days seem very long, I don't know about you, but I feel like every day is like three days. Even just tracking might give you some insight into where your time is going and then making decisions of what you want to change or prune or hack back. Yeah, there's there's a lot there, right? and it's 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 what I call turning your values into time. You know, we we all talk a good game about what we value in life, but if you really want to see what you value in life, you have to look at two things: how do you spend your time, and how do you spend your money? Mm -hmm. That's where you really see what values really matter to you. And so we have to remember we pay attention. There is a price to pay when we say paying attention. It's like paying money, right? And if you don't decide how you want to spend your time somebody's going to decide for you like you said earlier it's you know what's trending on netflix or what's what's going on on twitter or your kids want you your uh your, your spouse wants you there's all kinds of things going on that demand your attention i have to give you one tip because i think it's really going to help a lot of people we talked about this is i know this is a little bit off the the topic we were talking about in terms of indistractable kids but to help you as parents i know many of you are struggling with working from home and the kids are running around right and kids can be a source of distraction too let's face Face it, right? We're trying to do our work, and your child says, Mommy, Daddy, I need you for something or another. What do you do then, right? Even if you use all these tactics, you master internal triggers, you make time for traction, you hack back external triggers, you prevent distraction with packs, they they don't know that, that uh, you can't be distracted. What do you do? Here's what you do. I'm going to solve the problem for you. It's called the concentration crown, okay? Here's how it works. Look around your house and find the most ridiculous hat you own. Okay, everybody has a hat that's ridiculous, okay? Yeah. Mine, mine's actually in the bedroom. Find a hat that's ridiculous. You put, there you go, perfect. Put it on your head, discuss this with your child, of course, and you <laughs> tell them when mommy or daddy is wearing the concentration crown, you see that, that's a great example. When you see mommy or daddy wearing the concentration crown, that means that I'm doing my focused work time. And I will bring you at these times, right? We're gonna have lunch together, we're gonna have play time here, you see, because you've made the schedule, right? You have to follow that step as well. But anytime mommy or daddy is wearing the concentration crown, that means that I can't be disturbed. And the reason this works so well is because you don't, you know, kids don't know. If you're doing this all day on your computer, you're just typing away, they can't tell if yeah. that's time can or cannot be interrupted. So to make it explicit, to have a clear visual signal that says that is a time when I can't be interrupted works incredibly well with children. It also works really well with spouses too, by the way. Uh, it works with them as well. So that's what we call the concentration crown. I also love it because it's playful, right? You're, you're not trying to be like, don't talk to me. Like I'm going to be super strict. It's super playful and it's a very easy visual reminder. If you walk into the living room and you see that you see this on my head, you're going to be like, ah, she's in the zone. I got it. And you know what? I don't want to talk to someone with that weird crown on anyway. So I'm going <laughs> to let her do her thing. Oh my gosh. Okay. I love it. I love the concentration crown. I might get one though that I can move my head because this is a candle holder and it would be very <laughs> hard to type. Yeah. Like, but my wife went on Amazon and got one that's like this, this uh, plastic wreath around her head with LED lights. So it's yeah. like actually lights up. You can't miss it from you know a mile away. The, the funny thing is someone just told me that they um, are sending me a captain's hat, a sparkly sequined captain's hat. Totally Perfect. random. So that's coming my way. I think that's meant to be. Um, so everyone needs to go. All, all orders on Amazon for weird hats are going to shoot up. Uh, <laughs> I love the hat idea. Amazing. So Nir, I want to thank you so much for joining me again, for digging a little bit deeper into this topic, for helping those of us who are working from home, parenting in a crisis. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for giving me your time. I know that you're probably multitasking right now, watching your kids. Maybe your kids are in the background. Of course, we are going to record this. I know we had a couple hundred emails of people asking, are you going to have the replay? I, 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 don't, I don't have childcare right then. So yes, of course, we will send up the replay to this. If you are not on Nir's newsletter, please get on his newsletter, nirandfar.com. We pop that in the chat. I want to thank everyone. If you have ideas for other webinars, other topics you want me to really dive deep into, people you want to bring me on, you're always welcome to email support at sciencepeople.com. Nir, I want to say major thank you. Air hug. Air hug. Thank you. Thank you. So great to see you. All thanks so much for having me on. Singapore. Air hug and air high fives to everyone who watched. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>